Hey guys, welcome to another episode of VRF Viewpoint. My name is John Oaks, and I will be your host today. So, this video will be the first of a four part series on VRF to answer the question, what is VRF? And more specifically, what are the characteristics of VRF that you would see in the field? And so, this is going to be specific yet generic at the same time because I want what I say to be true for all, if not most manufacturers or most, if not all. And so when you're looking at one of these systems, there's going to be three key or three, three distinct areas of the system. You're going to have the outside equipment. You're going to have the inside equipment and you're going to have the piping that connects it. Okay. Now this is specific to air source VRF. Water source VRF will be a little bit different um, in the fact that the outdoor portion will be inside as well, but connected to a, a water source. Um, so the outdoor equipment, what are the characteristics? Well, for starters, VRF is a heat pump based technology, meaning it is refrigerant driven. It is going to have a heating mode as well as a cooling mode. And um, in these systems, heat is not created. Uh, for example, how you would create heat with uh, electric resistive heat or through combustion. The heat in a heat pump system is going to be collected and then redistributed or collected and then rejected instead of being created. The exception to that is the heat of the compressor, which will, in heating mode, will actually be absorbed into the refrigerant and then used to help heat the building. Um, the outdoor portion is going to be variable capacity. And what this will look like is multiple compressors. Sometimes um, some systems will have a single variable speed compressor. Some will have multiple variable speed compressors. Some will have a variable speed compressor and a single speed compressor. Depends on the, the system. Um, depends on the manufacturer. Some systems you can twin or put together multiple outdoor units. And so you may have two or three, uh, it's not really appropriate to call them condensers, but outside units that are, are twinned or paired together. And they work together as one. And the, the more compressors and the more capacity that you have that is variable, the larger the turndown rate or the larger the, the capacity range that the system can handle. Um, so, typically, they are going to have inverters, at least to some degree. At least something in the, in the one of the compressors will have an inverter, most typically. Um, they will also have accumulators and or receivers. And the reason for this is that if I have a, let's say it's a 20-ton system. It's two variable speed, 10-ton compressors. If I have a 20-ton system and it's running at 12 tons of capacity, well, where does the refrigerant go that I would need the additional refrigerant for that 20 tons of capacity? And the answer is there has to be space in the system for that to sit while it's not being used. And that's typically going to be in accumulators and receivers. Um, the other thing you're going to typically find is an oil return system of some sort. And this may look like an oil separator. This, If there's multiple compressors, you're going to have uh, oil equalizer lines similar to what you'd have on tandem compressors. You may also have advanced systems where the, the whole system goes into an oil return mode and changes its behavior for a short time to return oil back to the, the outdoor unit. Oil return is going to be incredibly important because the speed and the velocity of the refrigerant is going to change as the compressors ramp up, ramp down, as the load in the building changes. And so um, a system that ignores oil return is going to be very short-lived. Nine out of 10 compressors agree that oil return is an important thing. Um, so that's for the outdoor system. On the indoor system, you're going to have multiple circuits. Um, most often they're gonna be what I would call heads, which are going to be refrigerant circuits or refrigerant coils within a small air handler. Uh, that may look like a, a high wall unit, what you'd typically associate with a mini split. That may be a cassette style unit. Those are, either, those are the styles that would sit up flush with the ceiling 
two by two or three by three. Sometimes they're sized to actually fit in the space of a, a two by two ceiling tile in the T-bar. Um, you have some units that you know, are designed to look like a, a radiator and they take the same shape roughly of a, of a steam radiator. Um, there's multiple different styles. You also have indoor units that will heat or cool water. I mean, there, there's a lot of different things that you can uh, connect to a VRF system. And so what I will say is that you will have multiple indoor circuits. Now, I don't ever see these paired up with just one indoor unit. Um, you will not be seeing TXVs and cap tubes and, um, you know, pistons or anything like that as your primary metering device. You're typically going to have LEVs and EEVs because the capacity control is much greater and there are sometimes other things that those circuits need to be able to do. Sometimes they need to open fully wide for various reasons, close off completely, etc. And so you're typically going to have those more advanced electronic style metering devices and you're going to have tons and tons of sensors. I mean, I'm, I'm not just saying you're going to have a sensor in the space. You'll have a sensor in the space and you'll have a sensor in the return air or in the discharge air um, on the coil. You're going to have sensors throughout the system. And, and typically when you hook up to a VRF system, it's going to report that data to you. And it's going to be dozens, if not hundreds of data points for one of these systems which is going to be very useful to you in commissioning and working on these systems and diagnosing them. But with all those components, you also have the possibility of a lot of weird things happening depending on what component fails. Um, you're going to have advanced controls and communication systems in place. This isn't just 24 volt thermostat sending say, hey, I need heat. The systems are going to be reporting, you know, here's the superheat I'm at. Here's my valve position. Here's the, the temperature in the space. Here's the fan speed that I'm on. Um, if you have 20 indoor heads in a system, they need to accurately be able to, to report to the, the outdoor unit, hey, we have more units that need heat or cool, or they all need cooler, we're going to shut down. Or the outdoor unit needs to be able to say, hey, I'm going into defrost, you guys need to change your valves to be like this. The whole system starts to work as one, and you can't do that with, without advanced controls. And so what that looks like is going to be dependent manufacturer to manufacturer, but they're, they all have some integrated style of control that is going to be inherent to the system, which is very important. And learning the specific controls for the, the brand that you're working on will be part of getting over the learning curve of working on that particular brand. Um, and I will also add that unless that is, unless that's built into a, a, a air handler in some way, you're going to have a fresh air unit paired with this piece of equipment. And that's code for commercial buildings and it's logical for residential style buildings. Um, that's going to look like a makeup air unit. That's going to look like an ERV, an HRV, a DOAS system, which stands for dedicated outside air system, DOAS. Um, and in the most crude way, you could just have fresh air duct piped into the return of the of the units. Hopefully not. And so get used to working on those. Okay, now, at this point, we've got one section left, which is the piping that connects the inside to the outside. And at this point, it's worth mentioning that VRF is broken up into two basic categories. You have what we would call a heat pump style system. And you have what we would call a heat recovery or heat reclaim style system. Now, what is that? What is the difference? A heat pump, pump style system is a fully variable capacity system, multiple indoor units. It's all that same thing, but it can only be in heating mode or cooling mode. And they have different ways of deciding, is this going to be in heat or cool? Sometimes you say this unit will be the master and it will decide, or we're going to take a vote or whatever. Some of them will actually throw an error code if you have units that are set to heat and cool at the same time. But the system will be in one mode. We'll go into heating. It will you know, have a large pipe, which is a gas pipe. And then you have a small pipe, which is a liquid pipe. And more often than not, you're going to have hot gas going down the gas pipe in heating mode and then returning liquid to a metering device in the outside unit. 
and then you're gonna you know go through flash the flash that into a liquid goes through the outside coil pick up heat collect heat and then send it to the compressor to be you know repumped uh compressed and sent back to continue heating the building in cooling mode that gas pipe instead of discharge is going to be suction and you're going to be sending liquid out going the opposite direction on the liquid line and so the entire flow like a like a smaller style heat pump will actually reverse and the units will be connected to that and will you know they'll have ways to determine where that flow goes through the different units now that is going to be one very specific style of of system a heat recovery system is going to have a piping arrangement such that any one coil can be in heating mode or cooling mode as needed and so if you have 20 units connected Five could be in heat, six could be in cooling, and the rest could be off. Or 18 could be in cooling and two could be in heating. And it can accommodate that. And so there's going to be some sort of valve arrangement between the outdoor and the indoor so that a coil can connect to the liquid line and the suction line for cooling or can connect to the discharge line and the liquid line for heating. And they can do that as needed. The outdoor unit is going to flip between heating and cooling modes, depending on, well, every manufacturer decides how to, to make that transition differently. But let's say they're in heating mode and they're not rejecting enough heat. They may switch to cooling mode and start rejecting some of the heat outside. It would be basically the outside coil in that simultaneous mode becomes the balance. So if you need more heat pulled into the system because you're in heating mode and you you know you're trying to heat the building up more than you're trying to cool it you'll pick up the extra heat outside you'll run that as an evaporator or if you're in cooling mode and you're trying to get rid of heat and you don't have enough units that need heat to get rid of it all you run a condenser outside to reject that heat out to the outside air okay and so we have those two different styles and so typically what i'm going to be speaking about will be heat recovery for Mitsubishi, these are called R2 systems. The heat pump styles for Mitsubishi are called Y series. Um, but if there's a question, I might get specific. Uh, know what you're working on when you're working on a system because how they operate, the air codes they throw, the, the behavior, the target temperatures, pressures, it's dependent on the series that you're working on or the style. Um, the piping arrangement between the indoor and the outdoor. You're going to have a lot of piping rules. If you are installing this, you've got to know the piping rules because they differ from manufacturer from manufacturer. Total maximum height. I mean, how far you have to go straight pipe before you can turn. Uh, special fittings that have to be used. Oil trap rules. You don't want to trap oil in these. Oil return is incredibly important with these systems. Um... And then you are typically going to have, like I mentioned before, some sort of an arrangement that will allow you to switch between heating and cooling in these re heat recovery style units. And so that may take the form of some sort of a branch box. For Mitsubishi, they call them branch controllers. They make them as small as like six ports up to 16 ports. And they may have a four port version. I'm not sure. I don't use the small ones. Typically what I work on are 10 port or 16 port units. Um... There's two pipes that connect this box to the outside unit. Um, and then there's the ports, and each port goes to one unit. And so depending on if the unit is in heating mode or cooling mode, the port will be connected to the appropriate headers to give it that, that heat or that cooling that it needs. Um, this is totally different in another manufacturer. Uh, uh, most manufacturers of VRF at the moment, and VRV will include Daikin in this, are using three pipes. But even how that arrangement is made is different manufacturer to manufacturer. Do not assume that it's going to be the same between everybody. This VRF is not necessarily a settled science as far as this is how you do it. Um, everyone is trying to get the same goal, which is high efficiency electric heat pump style heating but they all go about it very differently and so whether you're working on toshiba or, or fujitsu or lg or daikin or mitsubishi or whatever or agree and then you could just keep rattling them off um know how that unit is supposed to operate 
Um, this is actually one of the reasons that retrofitting these gets sort of interesting is that the the line set sizes and the piping arrangements that you have on the old system may not be appropriate to change manufacturers. Um, and we'll talk about that more. So those are the three basic portions of the system you're going to see. The outside equipment, the inside equipment, and the piping arrangements between them, which may include branch boxes, heat recovery boxes, whatever they're called branch circuit controllers um, and the next three videos I'm going to put out each one is going to touch on one of these three subjects more in depth with a, a slant towards Mitsubishi because that's my specialty so I really appreciate you watching this if this is something you're interested in you want to keep up with this content uh, please like the video subscribe and I will continue to to do what I can to to share my knowledge and um, and just talk about VRF because it's my passion. I love VRF and I am excited for the opportunity to talk to you. If there's content you'd like to see or questions you may have or you just want to call me out because I messed something up and I missed a huge facet of this, please comment below and we can, we can get into that. So until next time, my name again is John Oaks and this is VRF Viewpoint. Thank you.